Hello, everyone, and welcome to the QT2 Systems, my greatest moment podcast series. My name is Reem Jishi, and I'm the content director for QT2. Um, our featured athlete today is Jordan Scott. Jordan, welcome. Thanks very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. All right, so I'm just going to dive right into it. This, this series is called My Greatest Moment. So just tell us, tell us briefly without too much what your greatest moment is. Well, uh, just to hone in on just the singular moment was uh, shortly after the finish line at uh, Ironman Wisconsin. Didn't really know how exactly the day went, felt like it had gone well as it could. And, uh, but my mom who met me in the finishing shoot handed me the phone and revealed to me that I had managed to win the age group, um, which was so far beyond what I thought was even remotely possible on the day. And after what was an abysmal conditions and endurance event of the day, I just, I, I couldn't believe it. So it was, uh, it was a singular moment that was, I'll never forget. God, I can't even imagine that to know, like, because it's hard. You're on a course you want to know, but like, there's no one talking in your ear saying, hello, this is right. where, you know, where you are. And so to finish a race and like, that must've been like unbelievable to you. Oh, it truly was. Yeah. It, it was, it was, it was thoroughly unexpected and it, you know, it, it just, it didn't feel real for, for hours and hours after that I spent my had my phone out and I just kept updating the feed, assuming surely somebody in front of me lost their tracker and they're going to update the standings and I'm going to lose that spot. But, uh, you know, the hours went by, the ceremony came and uh, they hand me the plaque and that was that. So forever in your life now, you're going to be able to claim that you won an Ironman. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah, I've got the plaque to prove it. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, like I said, it was, it was thoroughly unexpected. I went out there just with the, with the hope and ambition of putting together the best race I could. The conditions of the day made it, went from let's have a strong performance to let's just get across the line and, uh, and be done with this thing. uh, And we'll just hope for the best. And so, you know, during, over the course of the day, um, on the on the one point on the bike, very few spectators. Even though Madison's famously, uh, you know, a, a well supported, well, you know, a lot of crowd experience there, um, just wasn't really there. But at one point on the bike, of course, somebody who was sitting in a parked car with the heat on that looked so much more comfortable than where I was, shouted out the window, "You're twenty first, I think something like that. And I, I I couldn't even reconcile what exactly how he was figuring that out. Yeah. But it kind of dawned on me sometime after, like, he must have been counting. There must have only been 20 some odd people that have gone by. And there's a pro field. And so I'm thinking to myself, that's got to be good. And then the same thing happened at the start of the run. I, I ran by somebody and they said, you're in 17. I said, oh, this is good. This is, this is good. This is enough. And then I spent some time on the run with what I found out after the fact to be uh, the, I think, third place pro male finisher. And I was running with him. We were side by side for a while. And he said, today's the day you just can't die. You just keep going and you're going to run yourself onto the podium. And I'm looking at him thinking, he might be my kind of my age. I got I to gotta keep this guy in sight. Yeah. And uh, then he dipped off and used the bathroom and I figured, okay, I'll see him again. Turns out, of course, he was on his second lap and I didn't ever see him again until we ran into each other at the uh, the award ceremony and had a little chat. And uh, I thanked him for the advice because it uh, he couldn't have been any more accurate. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, that day in Wisconsin, that was awful. Rain, cold, wind, everything. Oh, you know, just... and we ran the 70.3 the day before. The weather was beautiful. Uh, we went out to the finish line to watch people come across the line. I specifically went out to uh, to ask somebody at the med tent for uh, one of the uh, thermal blankets that they always give people. As Bruce said, tomorrow's going to be abysmal. Get a thermal blanket, fold it up and put it on inside your tri kit on your chest to stay warm the next day. And so I went out there and I did that. And thank the Lord I did. It was an absolute game changer. I kept it on the entire race. And, you know, I'm sure that that kept me from shivering too hard and falling off the bike. And uh, yeah, I mean, the greatest piece of advice I might've gotten all day long. 
so anyway, yeah, it was a, the, the day before, beautiful morning of, I think about 10 o'clock at night, I looked out the window from the hotel room and I saw the rain start coming in, going out to transition. The wind is just howling. The rain is coming down in sheets. And I am I have no idea like how anybody is going to survive all day out there. And, you know, to be fair, something like, something like three or 400 people didn't that started the race didn't finish a lot of people bowed out of the bike because they just couldn't I, I talked to a couple of people who had lost the ability to shift because their hands were so cold mm-hmm. and it was it was just tough and, you know it became such a grueling task I remember when you came off the lollipop it was like something like 13 miles back to transition and I didn't know if I was going to be able to get there. I was just running out of gas. I was getting cold and I just wanted to get off the bike and uh, got there, got turned around in transition, put the shoes on and said, okay, let's just go for it. Um, And then, you know, you're always a little bit warmer when you're running, of course. And so just trudged on, ran into Adam Farley or whatever his name was. um, And just, he told me to keep going. And so I did. So uh that was that so that morning when you show up to transition it's pouring rain and freezing did it ever cross your mind that you weren't going to start that day or were you like no I'm here let's no when the weather's that bad it is you know when it's miserable and when it's cold realistically the most comfortable part of your day is always going to be in the water Water's, you know, there's no wind in the water. The water's generally warmer than the air on cold days. And so uh, I knew, I knew the swim wasn't going to be the worst thing. It was going to be choppy and it was going to be hard, but uh, you know, I'd work for it. And so, and you, you know, the swim always goes the fastest. And so, but it doesn't stop you from coming out of the water and having that realization that by some rationale, you're a third of the way done. You got that part done. And so it, that for me is always like the, is a really motivating factor. It's like, um, third of the thing is done. Great. And to know that you start in a place that's well insulated from the weather, it made it tenable. Um, but then when we got out onto the bike, uh, it was like the first two miles, there's this part where you go through this, this kind of maze they have set up in a parking lot, which had just terrible drainage and so the bike course is going through places that are have like standing water that's three four inches deep and so the first thing that happens is your feet get soaked and now you're you're carrying around these cold heavy feet and you're like this is just going to be how the day goes and so um yeah i just went out and kept on pedaling kept uh tried to stay in the hunt tried to stay warm power numbers fell off from start to finish so it's probably poorly managed but uh it was it was just a day that we're continuing to move forward was really all the number one thing that was going to ensure that you got the result you hoped for yeah all right so i want to i want to take you back a little bit to when you started triathlon so talk to me about your first race what it was how you got into it how you decided to do it so uh Mostly it was chasing a girl. Uh, my now wife, she and I met through some mutual friends um, uh, over drinks and by a fire. And we were talking. She was expressing, you know, how into running she is, how established she is, her running career had been, and uh, how she had an interest in doing a, a half Ironman one day. And I, um, you know, didn't want to be timid or cowardly so I said you know I'd like to do that I could, I think I could I could find myself trying to trying to shoot for that as well and so she said yeah okay uh well do you want to go for a run maybe uh this week uh you know okay so I show up in you know practically basketball shoes and uh big long baggy shorts and to go for this run with this girl that's coming off of you know a good performance in Boston and I just got trounced yeah. but uh <laughs> And I hurt so bad for the weeks to follow, but I just kept showing up for the runs. My gear improved, my performance improved, and she just kept pulling me along. And uh, we started, you know, we both individually started finding our way into the pool, started swimming more, started getting on the bikes and, 
you know, we just put it together. So that way we showed up in Coeur d'Alene about a year after the, that initial conversation um, and had a really fun time on the day, you know, felt very accomplished, the two of us together. By that time, now we're well, we're well together and happy. And uh, it was a, a triathlon was this, this context for our relationship to really blossom. And uh, it, it suited both of our personalities and we kept on doing it. We chose, we did Coeur d'Alene and then followed up with Santa Cruz after that. And uh, yeah, we just kept driving. So, uh, so, well, we're still doing it. Although she's, uh, we just had our first, so she's been on a bit of a hiatus, but uh, she'll be back at it for Victoria 70.3 this year. All right. So when you say you said uh, Coeur d'Alene, Santa Cruz, those were 70.3s, correct? That's right. Those were my first. Yep. And what was the timing of, of court lane? What year was in terms that? of finishing time or no, no, time? But just in terms of what year was it? I'm just trying to date back to when oh, we sure, sure, of course. Yeah. So court lane was 2018. Uh, Cause we met in 2017 in the fall of 2017, we raced the summer of 2018 in court lane. Uh, I did 70.3 Santa Cruz three months later. And uh, I think yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so in 2018, we did Santa Cruz. And then the next year we did, um, I did Santa Cruz again. I did uh, Indian Wells uh, in 2019, just before things turned upside down for the pandemic. And we spent uh, a year on hiatus, kind of waiting for things to come back. All the races we'd signed up for had been deferred into XYZ. And uh, then come 2021, uh, coming out of the pandemic, my two friends that had kind of ushered me into the sport, um, one in particular, another QT2 athlete, encouraged us to sign up for our first full. So that was that was Coeur d'Alene in 2021, the uh, infamously hot day out there. And uh, so that was the first one. Uh, went pretty well, although I did take a tumble on the bike which uh, sacrificed my ability to have much of a run. But again, in similar fashion to Madison, it was just, it was a hot day. It was hard. It was about finishing. Got across the line, didn't have a great time, had low aspirations about how the day was going to go. Uh, went to roll down all the same. Found out uh, that the guy that was 90 seconds in front of me uh, took the final Kona slot for my age group. And so that kind of, set uh kind, kind of irked and i was like okay now i, I really got to do better than this and so then i started chasing kona after that yeah so on your first so just let, th thinking about this timeline so 2018 first half iron man and right. that came after not i mean sounds like you had been active growing up but you weren't like you know intensely training right no no training. no competitive <laughs> level of swim bike run at all yeah. uh the how i learned to swim was showing up for a for a, like a offhand swim thing in college where you know on day one everybody's introducing themselves and their history and swimming oh you know I had a d1 scholarship I won state and I'm, I'm just like I know how to swim um and so you know I you know kind of in the same fashion that uh, that my wife you know got me into running you know I just put myself in the, in the company of people that were far more accomplished and far better than I was, uh, and then just started keeping up. Yeah. Wow. So you went from, okay. So from that first race to winning an Ironman in four years and yeah, a yeah. Year, and, a year yeah. of that, you couldn't race more than the year of that. You couldn't race. Right. So that's a pretty, right, right, that's right. a pretty spiky trajectory. And then first Ironman, you go out there in I mean, <laughs> the Coeur d'Alene 2021, the stories I've heard from this, I mean, that that race is pretty infamous. I don't know if that one is more. I think that Wisconsin this year probably beats that in terms of how people talk about the weather, but Coeur d'Alene was awful. People were dropping like flies during it. First one, right. you have a crash, you finish and you're like, oh my God, it was only 90 seconds away. So that's got to go and tell you, all right, there's something here. Like, yeah. They right? told me to go sign up for, for Arizona. So I, I, I even bit the, uh, the bullet and bought the foundation entry to get myself into Arizona that night, that year. It was like, 
I don't care what it costs. I mean, <laughs> I got to do this. And so, uh, yeah, I got myself to Arizona. Arizona went well. Uh, you know, stayed on my feet, stayed on my bike, and uh, managed to get a slot for St. George the next year. And uh, that was in Arizona uh, in what would have been 2021 is where I met my now coach, Bruce. Uh, he and I had a little chat. He said, you know, your, your first race was impressive. If you got that close to Kona, you know, I think there's, there's a lot that we can do. I think we can make it faster. I think you can go uh, maybe a lot further than you really think you're capable of at this point. Um, but, you know, to that point, the coach that I had been working with had gotten me that far. Things were going well. So it seemed like uh, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Shortly thereafter, that coach dropped me because he kind of realized that I was outgrowing him. And uh, that's when I reached back out to Bruce and I said, you know, is it too late? And he said, no, I can get you in. And uh, he put the plan together to get me uh, raised my best uh, with the time we had at St. George, which went well enough for uh, for me to land in the mid 20s, I think, maybe 24th or something like that. 20s, no, 27th, maybe. I couldn't say. Um and I went to roll down uh, just for fun. And they called my name for Kona. And uh, I had to let it pass because my son was going to be born like a week or two before Kona. So I knew that that wasn't in the cards. But uh, similar to Coeur d'Alene, you, know, you know, I had a race that went relatively well. And I just needed to put another one on the calendar. And so that's when I kind of... Uh, made the late call to put Madison on the calendar, which was about two weeks before my son was born. So I ran out there with my mom who never actually never come to one of my races. Um, she had a fantastic time. Um, she was cheering and she had this fun experience where she kept having to ask other spectators for help, uh, you know, figuring out where I was going to be or what was going on. And she'd pull out you know, her phone and people be like, okay, well, what's your son's name or what's his number? And they both went up the phone and they pulled up the track and they'd be like, well, he, he's having a really good day. <laughs> and she was just beaming and just having consequently the best time for it. Uh -huh. And she had a whole bunch of signs out there, um, which were fun for her to hold, but on the regrettable side, she also didn't take like any pictures. So there wasn't a whole lot of documentation of it, but, um, yeah, and, you know, she figured out how to use that tracker. And so when she came into the finishing corral after the race and uh, she handed me the phone and showed me, she said, you won. Uh, I just couldn't believe it. And the guys that were sitting next to me must have inherently also had a good race. So we pulled up their results and suddenly, you know, there's this little this little trio of people that were all podium finishers in various age groups. And uh, everybody was just in disbelief, you know, after the day and the weather and everything that had come to pass it seemed so strange to have such euphoria because it was just so hard and so cold, but then suddenly, you know, nothing mattered. You're on top of the world. So that was great. That was great. How exciting that your mom got to be there and experiencing, but how'd she stay warm? Did she have her? Oh, <laughs> she was, she was bundled up. We bought, I bought her the VIP package. So she was well taken care of all day long. So that oh, was really good. good. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's that is such a nice thing that Iron Man offers. They make sure you're in the right place when you need to be. So okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. So you so you won, you know you won, but you're like refreshing the tracker over and over and over and over. You know, right. sure, like because yeah, there was there was one person in my age group that um was just knocking the socks off of everybody um on the day. But for whatever reason, he uh, he pulled out about 19, 20 miles into the run. Really? And, uh, and then that's when I ran into first because I came out of the water like fourth or fifth in my age group. I came off the bike third and then ran my way all the way to the front of the race uh, over the course of the marathon. That's interesting. You get to 19 or 20 on the run and. Well, something must have happened, right? I mean, but yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't yes, say, I mean, but I, I I owe my thanks. Well, you know, I mean, that's the thing though. Iron Man is such a long day, and you can't control all of those things around you. What you did control was right. you didn't stop a mile 19 or 20. You didn't stop when it got cold. You just kept on going and just plugged through it and did. You know, I always tell my athletes that if you finish a race and you're like, that's the best I could have done then you have a successful race in you, right? And, but 
to do the best you've done and know that the best you could have done was also the best. That's amazing. Right. That's so awesome. So, yeah. so then the award the ceremony, thing. you get, yeah. so tell, how did like, like hearing your name get announced as, as winning? So, that? yeah, I mean, it was, it was such a, like, like I said, it, you know, it just didn't feel real for the whole after the race and the morning of and the next morning going down. It's just like I kept thinking, like, you know, there must be like a half dozen people that just lost their trackers. And it's all this. And then, you know, we're going to we're going to reconcile back to kind of what my expectations might have been going into it. You know, I like I said, I'd hoped for a good race. I'd hoped to put myself close enough to the front so I could maybe get a Kona spot um, for the next year. And, and then take my family to Hawaii. And that was the hope. Uh, and so the, the first place was just thoroughly unexpected. Um, and, but it, it just, it was real. You know, they called, uh, they lined us all up to come up to the podium or to come up to the stage to collect the awards. And they, you know, they're asking, okay, what's your age group? What'd you place? And, you know, I, on a handful of occasions, I had to say, okay, first place. Okay. Then you stand there. And then, Mike Riley's on the stage and, you know, it calls up fifth, fourth, third, second, and then first place, our winner of the age group, Jordan Scott. I walked up, I collected my plaque. I, you know, I'm practically shaking and uh, just kind of looking out in the crowd, trying to figure out where to look for a picture. And yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And I spent so much time staring at that plaque. Like, I can't believe this happened. Yeah. I think but, I would too. It'd be like right in front of me. That is yeah, yeah. That is that's awesome. I love this. I mean, clearly have a passion and talent for the sport. So so I want to know why you are racing and your wife is now what like eight months and three weeks pregnant, right? Oh yeah. She, she's yeah, she's she's well along and home and not particularly happy that her husband isn't there. Yeah. Um, but I clearly was she tracking you during the day. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So she was happy. She was, she was like, you just need to get home and get this done. And, yeah. uh, so, you know, it was important. I capitalize on the experience and make the best of it. And so we certainly did that. And so I called her after the race and said, honey, we're, we're going to Hawaii. And, uh, she said, sweet. So, all right. Yeah. It, uh, I, I got to bring home good news. Anything other than that probably would have been a little bitter. But. Yeah, well, I think it's good that you got through the race before she went into labor. So that's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, my mom <laughs> had, had to sign a tough that, decision uh, if that had turned out a few days different. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, t I promised her I'd run to the airport, uh, you know, post haste, no matter where I was, if anything happened. And uh, and my mom had a sign that she thought was just hysterical, which said, uh, you know, hurry up, Mary called. <laughs> <laughs> what? Luckily, I couldn't, read it, so I didn't. I didn't have to stop. But uh, yeah, yeah, we got a picture with Mike Riley on that sign. It was, uh, it was comedic the whole day long. Yeah. Oh, well, you you certainly made the most of an absolutely horrendous situation, race, you know, weather situation on there. But you were stronger, overcame it, and God, what a an amazing story. You will always, always have that. What a great story to tell your son, and to you know, just remember. Yeah. So when the days it get was, off, it, you know, you'll have it to come back to. Yeah, you know, it was, you know, it's a, it's, it's an individual sport, but it is a team effort. You know, I, I've got the support of my wife and my family, and uh, you know, I have, I have infinite thanks to extend to my coach Bruce for, uh, for, for keeping me on track and and bringing the best out of me. And so, uh, you know, it's just been an honor to. To, to have this journey and have the support that I have and uh, and to see how you know everything that we've done got me to that place and then that this place you know that accomplishment uh, has has extended my horizon and and given me the opportunity to finally uh, toe the line at Kona and uh, just to experience this thing as fully as I you know might as I've always hoped to and uh, I'm just, I'm, I just consider myself so exceptionally blessed and, you know, I'm so cognizant of, of how much help I've had along the way. Yeah. So it yeah. feels like honoring them uh, as much as it feels like honoring myself by, by getting these results. Yeah. That's great. Oh, thank you so much, Jordan, for sharing your story. Just 
it's awesome. I'm so happy for you for everything that you that you've accomplished. And come October of next year, I'll be tracking you over at tracking you at Kona. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. All right. Thank you.